Well, good to be with you in worship and those who are maybe joining us through YouTube and from video as well. Um, I know we've all processed some heartbreaking, tragic news this week and, and are praying for the families who have lost those children. And we're praying for, along with that, better methods of protecting our children. I know I heard that the Texas Governor Abbott is looking for new legislation, some way to stop those weapons uh, from getting into the hands of those who are really unstable. Um, painful even to see how the details roll out of how it happened and a door left open and, a, and a, a, an 18 year old who obviously is not and was not stable. So many hurting in the process so we lift them up in prayer. This Sunday marks the story of Jesus departing from the disciples and returning to his father. It's known as Ascension Sunday on the Christian calendar, and hopefully our journey through the Easter season over the last few weeks has been one of, one of encouragement and one of hope, one of promise. We have recounted the appearance of Jesus' disciples together in worship, and it's given us pause to consider our own walk, our own personal encounter with the risen Lord as well. But even as we heard the tenor of their questions, as they thought about his departure, their own version of what now, what happens next, um, our spiritual lives sometimes seem to be a continual stream of peaks and valleys, of high points and low points as well, processing life through the lens of who Jesus is, and now Jesus resurrected and ascended. So how often do we think and pray about a deeper encounter a deeper understanding of his ways over our own. So as we look to the words of Jesus to his disciples in John chapter 14, we might wonder if they saw his ascension as a sudden and unexpected end to the celebration of the resurrection. Very much like we feel ourselves when we question God's personal presence in our lives. So we look at a couple of scriptures that happen before his crucifixion in John chapter 14, Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Judas, not Iscariot, but Jude, son of James the Elder, said to him, Lord, how is it that you reveal yourself to us and not to the world? which probes a little bit deeper in why aren't things better all around us. If you have been here and now you're going, and then next after he has come and appeared several times after the resurrection, he's ascending and they ask, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They are expecting things to happen on a time scale and things that um, fall short of what Jesus is doing in their lifetime and so that's why these questions before and after the crucifixion help us to consider our own questions about the day-to-day -day ins and outs of life until the second coming of Christ. Jesus knew his disciples would not understand his departure with his ascension any more they understood his departure at the cross. So he takes time to comfort them and encourage them here in John chapter 14 helping them understand what he's doing. So our text today revisits Jesus spending time with his disciples before his departure to encourage them. In his words to them, we can also hear him speaking comfort and encouragement to us for those times we question what he's doing. So let's read from John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. And anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Notice the passage begins with Jesus replied. And so we look back as we have and see his conversations with them that begin at the Lord's table. He's told them that he's going away. Judas, son of James, says, Well, How is it that you haven't revealed yourself to more people? Why won't you show yourself to everyone? If you're going, is, is the job done yet? Is it over? Wouldn't things be better in this world if others knew you, the healer, 
the source of life as we do? Shouldn't you reign victorious over the whole world and the world recognize you as king and as Lord and Savior? We can continue to ponder and build upon James' question. Have you ever had that question? Maybe you've had it this past week as we think about the lives of those families and we pray for them. We prayed for other families at Sandy Hook. We prayed for families at Littleton, Colorado. Don't you and I get tired of seeing the world continue to struggle with hatred, with death, with prejudice, with the loss of 10-year-old lives because an 18-year-old doesn't know his purpose for being alive? We do. We do. Now, this isn't to hide that the disciples had some personal interest, some selfish interest in the world being better and their king and their savior being everyone's savior because, of course, um, cream rises to the top. They would rise with this kingdom that would now rule. <laughs> As their, one of their mothers asked Jesus, will my sons be at your left and right when you inherit this? Will they be ruling with you right up there at the top? So we're, we're not unaware of some of their immaturity and selfish motives, even as we have some selfish motives, wanting the world to be a better place so it's easier on you and me, so we don't have to face the death or loss of a loved one in an elementary school shooting, so we can feel safer in our own homes at night. So we, we know that it's that, that mixture of wanting it for us too. But the questions come up. Why don't you intend? Why don't you show yourself to the world like you do us? If we know the Lord, we know what truth and freedom really is. We know the love of the Father for the whole world. We know that the world, uh, what the world puts forth as love is a sad substitute and often even a justification uh, for hate. But when we know him personally, for he truly, for who he truly is, who he's revealing himself to be, we are set free to live in faith and hope and love. But when we look around, it's painfully clear. Most do not see this reality. We are trying to see through a glass darkly. We are exercising faith because what we see in the world is not the fullness of what God intends. Most are still caught in the bondage of sin. Where knowing God is the last thing they desire. Manipulation, lies, violence, 19 children dead, the exploitation that plays out day to day, day in and day out in our world, sometimes has us asking the same question. Why have you shown yourself to us, to me, but not to everyone else? Wouldn't it be better if the whole world could see you for who you are as well? Speaking of Jesus, we want everyone to see what we see and believe what we believe because we know the truth <laughs> and the truth sets us free and we know his promise it's a wonder that people make it through really tragic times of suffering without knowing Christ isn't it truly but in fact part of the reason we sense so much wrong is because uh, not walking with Christ continues to take this toll on our planet and on everyone who lives on the planet sometimes we're shocked why everyone wouldn't see the beauty of the gospel. It seems so simple and so plain. But when we read and remember how the Spirit must open the eyes of the blind to see, as he has ours, we know that God's timing is different than our own. So we ask, Lord, do you intend to? When do you intend to? We may also identify with the disciples who gathered around the table with Jesus in a second way. They thought they'd signed up for something bigger than themselves. They thought they were going to be part of Jesus overthrowing the Roman rule, setting Israel free, part of a movement that was going to culminate in an obvious political and powerful victory in their day. But now Jesus is talking about leaving. And their big dreams of becoming part of this historic movement were coming to an end. It seemed like there's been a political uh, rally but the inauguration is suddenly missing in their minds in front of the whole world instead of crucifixion. Like every other human on the planet, we want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We desire to be part of something that's significant. We don't want to just live mediocre lives. We want significance of all kinds. 
but so much of what the world counts as significant leaves us empty and hollow. So in knowing Jesus, we know we've encountered the most significant person and purpose in human history. And it's an exciting privilege to be included in what he's doing. So when Jesus doesn't move as fast as we would like, or worse, when he moves in a direction that seems like um, he has done here for them, and, and it's not including us the way we thought, we may feel like he's letting us down. The original disciples must have felt and dealt with that feeling when Jesus told them he was going away. Where? How can we know where you're going? We haven't been there. You know, they throw these questions back at him as he's trying to prepare them for what's going to happen. But they would later have a better understanding of God's timing. Listen to the once impetuous Peter, the one who rushed ahead when everybody held back. The Lord is not slow about his promise. Second Peter 3 and verse 9. As some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so if we could pause there for a moment and reflect on the disciples' lives, Jesus delayed their big celebration because he wanted to include us in the invitation. And when we feel like it's got to be soup, it's got to be over, it's got to end, let's remember, God doesn't count time the same way as we do. And he has other people's precious lives in mind. Even as some die of sickness and in a horrible accident. That God has a big picture and a big plan. And he's the Lord over life. Peter continues, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. And the elements will dissolve with fire. And the earth and everything that is done in it will be disclosed that all of what we struggle with so much in this flesh is going to be burned up, renewed, started over, reconstituted. Some of the things we're fighting for won't matter, don't matter, but it's what we're used to in the flesh. It's what we're culturally familiar with in the flesh. It's what we think we need to cling to in the flesh. So Jesus answers by reminding us of a bigger picture. He answered them the same way. Like the disciples around the table with him, what they were excited about fell short of what Jesus was actually doing. Like the quote we just heard from our president, Greg Williams, as he was quoting C.S. Lewis, sometimes we would be happy with playing in a mud puddle when he's got a vacation on the seashore in mind because that's our, 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 our goals are too small. Our love is too little. We may think, now I'm a part of something that will give my life meaning, something that others will have to take note of. Maybe it's landing the job you've dreamed of your whole life, or when you're young, having a family of your own, or attaining a level of independence that was once beyond your reach. It can be any number of things that we see as giving us significance. And they may be very good things, or even something not so good. But whatever level of significance we rise to, it doesn't take long to realize we still have a desire for more. Deep down, we know that we're made for more than anything that just this earth and the goals of this life, apart from Christ, could offer. Our souls continue to long for that elusive significance we are unable to give ourselves. And so Jesus' response to Judas may be a good reminder for us as well. Jesus responds with a picture. In answer to Judas' question, why don't you show yourself to the world as, as we know you, he talks about a relationship of belonging to the Father, a relationship of obedience grounded in love and not duty. Then he goes on to say that this is the relationship the Father wants to share with everyone, with the whole world. The disciples wanted Jesus to give Israel a place. Jesus was up to something far greater. He is giving the world a place in Israel a place he himself as the Son of God in relationship to the Father and the Spirit wants to share in a cosmic level. Now the disciples may have felt their significance was at risk. What about us? How, what's going to happen? Where are you going? How, what are we going to do? And often we do the same thing. We see Jesus as a way to fulfill our dreams and goals and miss the fact that Jesus is our dream. 
and our goal. We overlook the relationship brings to us that he talks about here in John and then set our sights far short of the goal. In knowing Jesus and his Father by the Spirit, we will find a significance we cannot give ourselves. It's a significance that is in a relationship of love that has to be received as a gift of grace. He gives it to us. It is in his very nature to do so. It is wonderful. It is beautiful. We find it hard to believe and dis difficult to grasp. I want to refer to a scripture that isn't on the screen that Paul shares to, with the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24. As he finishes this resurrection chapter, this beautiful picture of bodies delivered from mortality to immortality, uh, from struggle to final victory, and, and the glory of one being different than the glory of another. Then he talks about Jesus in relationship to the Father, and he says he's, that he hands the kingdom up to the Father, verse 24, after he's destroyed all dominion. He delivers everything up to the Father. Because for Christ, owning the universe is, is not the goal. Sharing it with the Father is the goal. Handing it back to the one who has shared it in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from the beginning. I don't know if you've ever thought about that verse before. The greatest thing and the greatest joy can, that Christ can have is after all dominion and everything that is evil, after every elementary school shooting has been squashed and can never happen again, he says, here it is, Dad. This is, this is, this is what we planned. And those who are with it is a relationship, and experiencing the Father in Christ through the Spirit is sharing his very goal and purpose for life itself. I know so often we see shorter purposes, shorter, less valuable, more impermanent goals. But Jesus' departure is a gift that provides the means of growing into and receiving more of the relationship he has brought us into. Jesus leaving is the way of being more fully with us. Jesus says, unless I go, you should be thankful that I'm going. It's a good thing that I'm leaving you. What? I tried telling that to our grandchildren a couple of weeks ago, and they didn't get it either. It's a good thing that we're going so that Grandpa and Grandma can come back with even more. It's very hard in the flesh to see leaving as ever benefiting us in any way. But the reason that it benefits is because Jesus says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And you're going to have a presence that's even better than just my physical body eating fish with you by the ocean. That you will have a continual presence. I will never leave you or forsake you. That you, ha you can now ask things in my name and the Father hears. We are present. We make our home and our dwelling and our abode in you. You're connected to the vine and nothing can take you off. Jesus locates this gift in the gift of the Holy Spirit that's coming on Pentecost. Just as a bride and groom must leave their father and mother to discover a new and very special relationship of a lifetime, we must be willing as well to leave our comfort zones, our cultural, our political, and even our familial backgrounds for a deeper relationship with him. Let's look at John chapter 13, verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. You're not gonna lose anything. In fact, you're gonna remember things you've already forgotten. You're going to have a better memory of what it means to be in relationship with God when the Spirit comes than me standing here telling you about this miracle. Notice the Holy Spirit is not bringing something new or different than what Jesus has already given. Jesus is the word of God already spoken to us, but the Spirit will continue to teach us, to help us unpack the significance of who this word, Jesus, is to us and who we are in relationship to him and the Father. And the Spirit not only teaches, he also reminds us of what Jesus has already said. And so the picture here is a significance we never move from. The Spirit aims to move us deeper into this truth. 
But he's not moving beyond it as if there's something more that Jesus held back. Sometimes we may be tempted to think of Jesus in this way. And we may think to ourselves that now that we know who Jesus is, we can move on, move on to really deep waters. And perhaps we got our theology right. We can get to the real business of doing ministry, doing something significant with our lives. But when we think like this, we're revealing that we don't fully know who Jesus is. It would be like going back to 1 Corinthians 15. And Jesus, when he's conquered all dominion and all evil is squashed, then he takes the kingdom and says, Father, this is what I've been waiting for. It's all mine. Now I'm significant. No, that is not the direction of the relationship. Because the relationship ultimately is the goal. It's hard for us as human beings, as brothers and sisters growing up in families. It's hard for us as husbands and wives when we differ to know that the relationship is the goal. It's hard for us as neighbors and brothers and sisters in Christ. But Jesus has been telling us that over and over in his three and a half years with them. He said, if you bring your gift to the altar and then suddenly realize that you're at odds with your brother, leave the gift there. I mean, God appreciates the gift. Don't get, don't get me wrong, God speaking, but he said, it's that relationship I'm looking for above anything else you could give me, that you would be in a relationship with me and with your brother and with your son and with your daughter and with your neighbor that is reflective of the love of God dwelling in us. Now that's our challenge. That's a big challenge, but it's a much deeper significance than anything we would strive for on our own. And so by God's grace, the Holy Spirit is sent to help us know him more. We will discover that there's nothing more to move on to, nothing more significant than what we have in Christ. No, I'm not saying that we have nothing more significant than we have already experienced. Our experience of Christ has a lot of room for growth, both in this life and in the next. And we will find it the most significant thing in the universe, even as Jesus himself is that way with the kingdom. The son's relationship with his father is the most significant and eternal relationship there is, and we are invited to participate in that. In that relationship, we will find that our longing has been answered, fully satisfied in Jesus. The striving for significance will cease. In light of the great significance our inclusion in the Trinity gives us, we can trust that the Spirit, what he's doing in our present lives, is of great value and of great significance. Even the mundane is majestic, that every single event in every day can in some way point us toward our inclusion and our participation. From a sunset to a birthday party to a hug when someone has experienced loss. On top of this, he also shares with us his peace. Let's notice John 14, verse 27 through 29. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away, and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. It just gets bigger here, folks. He said, it's not closing down. He said, greater works you will do than these. And the church has. And will continue to. I've told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. He knew they couldn't fully grasp. He answers questions that they can't receive, but they do receive it. They do believe it. They do live into it when the Holy Spirit comes. Peter, who is impetuous, <laughs> walks by someone and just the shadow falling over those who are asking for healing, and they go away healed. He contrasts this peace with what the world offers. At the best, the world offers a ceasefire, a temporary peace, a bit of conflict avoidance, no permanent solution to be found. But his peace continues even in the middle of our conflict and chaos and overrides it. The significance we gain in belonging to Jesus is one that is accompanied by peace. 
because nothing will ever separate us from the Father. No matter what we face, we're never alone. The one that faced the cross, the one that faced all dominion and all power and all evil is with us every single day. Jesus knows the disciples are discouraged. He knows we get discouraged. He knows they're afraid because he told them he's going away and coming back. Then he seems to indicate that their fear and discouragement has something to do with their love for him. If they loved him, Jesus said, they would be glad that he's returning to the Father. He said, if you get this, you're going to rejoice with me that this is the way the plan is going. It appears that the love the disciples have for Jesus is a bit of a possessive love, not a mature love, but it will be ripened by the Holy Spirit's presence. They can't think of him going away as a good thing because they want to keep him around for their own purpose a little longer. But love for Jesus means we trust him and what he tells us. If he needs to go away, we can even be glad about it, even if we don't fully understand why, because we know in the end it is for our good and not just for ours, for the entire world. It doesn't mean we're not sad at his departure. It doesn't mean we're not sad when we lose a loved one, but it's a sadness that is fitting to the undergirding peace and the joy that comes in trusting in him as Lord and Savior. Jesus and his Father don't do anything to our heart. God is love. To love Jesus and his Father is a peace and a freedom on a scale that the world can't offer. And even this love is a gift of God's grace. So notice how he ends the passage. He's telling the disciples that he is leaving for a good purpose. That he intends to build their faith, not squash it. How often do we hold back telling someone the good news News they don't want to hear, but need to hear for their own good, simply because we don't want to upset the apple cart or hurt feelings. Thankfully, our Lord loves us enough to upset our feelings, which are fleeting, in order to build our faith in that which is permanent. Jesus was willing to disappoint his disciples in the moment so that they could enter a greater joy, a fuller joy, a truer joy. He is the way, the life, and the truth. And he's committed to bringing us into this significant peace with his Father that he shares with us by the Spirit. Let's pray about that. Father, like the disciples, we who have the Holy Spirit still feel the discomfort of a world that doesn't know you fully, even as we come to know you more completely. Strengthen our faith. Continue to pour out your grace and your Spirit upon us. We thank you that you have returned to the Father so greater works than these can be done. Surround us with your love. Help us to know that love, to believe that you have in fact conquered death itself and that all dominion will be finally owned only by the Father and the Son and through the Spirit. And that with great joy, we too will lift up all that we are, all that we have, and all that you've created to your glory, singing to your glory continually. We praise you for your purpose. Help us to be more permanent-minded. And Father, again, we lift up those who've lost loved ones here this past week, that they may see a fully, fuller picture of your promises and know that you are the God of their resurrection, that you are the God of all comfort, that when everything seems to fall apart, we can still lean on and trust and know your peace because you're eternal life. You are eternal life in Christ. And so we ask these things in his name. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.